All right, Romans 14, Romans 14, verse 12. Romans 14, verse 12. Now, uh, a funny thing happened on the way coming to and from church today, but uh, my Bible is gone that I've been using all these years in these meetings. It's uh, that brown one with the dog ear out of it. Uh, that disappeared. And then a big red notebook about three times as thick as that one with 42 sermons in it. And that stuff all disappeared between uh, dinner and right now, and I don't know where it's at. So tonight I don't have any notes, so I'll just, I'll just ad-lib one. I'll reach back in the, in the bar barrel and pull an old one out and just ad-lib it. <laughs> yeah, and if you've got a Bible there, get Romans 14, verse 12. And the text there says, uh, Every one of us, so then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, that means that your primary concern is your relationship with the Lord, nobody else. And I don't know how long you've been saved. I've been saved 53 years. And I must confess the hardest thing I've had to ever do in my life as a Christian is keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. They're always in somebody else. It's always people, just people, people, people around. And something always interferes, something blocking between you and Christ. Human problems all the time. Uh, I don't mind telling you, I get sick of people after a while, you know. I don't have very good pastoral qualifications. I don't like people. <laughs> Pastors are supposed to love people. I don't love them. I don't even like them. <laughs> now, I make individuals. See, I have individual friends I like and I love, but just people as a mass, you know, just, just, don't, just don't impress me. Thing, uh, coming up, uh, it's just people, 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 people. And that Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. If you had all the people in this church right now that have come into this church or belong to this church, you'd be running 3,000 in Sunday school. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. You say, where are they? Well, people are fickle. They're fickle. Up one day and down the next day. Here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> they have no consistency, you know. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I, I pick my friends. I don't have to pick my enemies, they accumulate. <laughs> but I pick my friends. I like some people better than other people. I love my family and that kind of thing. But, but uh, sometimes I just get tired of looking at people, and I just wish I could see Jesus Christ. Amen. I get tired of churches. I've been 800 of them. I get tired of getting chalk all over my hand and my suit and have to have a laundry bill of 15 bucks a week to get the stuff clean with. I get tired of these airplanes. I get tired of these motels. I get tired of everything. I just get tired of seeing everything. I just, sometimes I just like to see Jesus Christ. I've preached about Him for 53 years and never even seen Him. I'd like to see Him. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, I'm supposed to look unto Him. Well, where do you see Him at? I can't see Him. Got to walk by faith. And there's people all the time. People. Something always coming up. The hardest thing to remember, brethren, is so then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Amen. You won't give any account for me at all. It'd be just like if I never crossed your path. And I won't give account for you. I'll have to give account of myself for what I said to you. I'll have to give account of myself for my effect on you. But I'll give account of me. I won't give account of anybody else. Everyone else should give account of himself to God. You know if southern men could learn that, more of them would get saved and what get saved. But they always got their eyes on somebody else. Always talking about the hypocrites in the church, the hypocrites in the church, the hypocrites in the church. You know, after you the average conversation goes like this. So you say, well, now, preacher, no use trying to lie about it. <laughs> well, I didn't ask the guy to lie about it. I'm just going to ask you a question. <laughs> I said, are you saved? Just well, no, 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 no lying about it, preacher. I don't live like I should, but I'll tell you one thing. When I get saved, I'm going to live it. You ever hear that? I'm not going to be like a lot of these folks go to church, you know, hypocrites. I'm going to live it. Boy, I wish I had a buck for every time I heard that. I mean, down south, up north, out west, and back east. And it's always the other fella, and it's always the other fella's hypocrites. You notice that? Did you notice that? I mean, you go in the homes, you know, where they, where they play pool, and they talk about hypocrites that play bingo. <laughs> and you go in the home where they play bingo, and they talk about hypocrites that believe in mixed bathing. You go in the home where they have mixed bathing, and they talk about the hypocrites that smoke. You go on home to the, where the folks smoke, and they talk about the hypocrites that drink beer. And you go home where they have to drink beer, and they talk about the hypocrites that play bingo. It's always somebody else. Do you ever notice that? It'd be refreshing to go in a house sometime and have a guy say, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> but, 
But they never say that. They never say that. I never heard that one time in my life. I'm a hypocrite. A lady came to Cotton Mercer one time. He's an evangelistic friend of mine down in Crestview, Florida. Call him Cotton Mercer. Ted, uh, Jim Mercer is his real name. They call him Cotton. And old Cotton Mercer, Cotton Mercer, he says a woman came to him. She had a big dip of tube rose in her mouth. That's snuff if you know what it is. And she said, Preacher, she said, what does that there verse of Scripture mean? And it says, whatever not of faith is sin. What does that mean? <laughs> He looked her right in the face and said, well, what do you think it means? She said, if I don't mean going to the ball game on Sunday, I don't know what it do mean. <laughs> That's how they are, you see. They always think it's the other fellow. They always think it's the other fellow. I was in a gas station one time. The guy was pumping gas back in the old days when they waited on you. And he's in and out of the gas station for about 30 minutes while I was trying to deal with him about his soul. And I never got anywhere with him. Went round and round. Hypocrites in the church, hypocrites in the church, hypocrites in the church. Too many hypocrites in the church, you know, preacher. Hypocrites in the church. And finally, after about 30 minutes, I said, I can tell you play at one place you can find more hypocrites than in a church. He said, where's that? I said, in the gas station. <laughs> and <laughs> he didn't appreciate that a bit, you know. No sense of humor at all, you know. Some people don't have any sense of humor. Uh, always hypocrites in the church. And they always worry about them in the church, never any place else. And they, they don't keep you out of a ball stadium. They don't keep you out of the grocery store. They don't keep you out of Walmart. How come they keep you out of church? Yeah, well, Rock, when those folks in church, they profess something. Oh, I don't know. I preach in all kinds of churches. I know a lot of Christian Americans don't profess anything. Um, not everybody you see in it that goes to church professes to be saved. You know that if you do any personal work. Now, you take right down south, most of them are. But, man, I can take you place up north where there are millions of them that profess to be saved that don't go to church, and millions that go to church don't profess to be saved even though they're going to church. You're always worried about the wrong bunch. Oh, and now I come up this fellow here, I say, pardon me, sir, you say, and he says, before you go talk to me, he said, uh, go down the street there and talk to old man so-and-so. He and me both drink out of the same bottle, and he's a deacon in the Baptist church. I say, okay, I'll go down and talk to him. I'll give it a try. So I go down to so-and-so, this man, whoever he is, and Mr. Smith, Mr. Johnson, whatever, I say, pardon me, sir, are you saved? He says, well, I hope I am. I say, I hope you are too, are you? Well, I do the best I can. I said, the best thing you do is trust Christ your Savior. Have you done that? Oh, yes, yes, I've done that. Well, good, good. Then you profess to be saved, right? Yes. You profess to be washing the, law, in a, in a, you know, uh, wa washing the blood, long white robe, treading the pilgrim pathway on the way to heaven, right? Yes. A little bit stout there. A little bit stout. <laughs> This fellow's a little bit stout. And he gets on the weighing machine, you know, and the card comes back and says, one at a time, please. <laughs> and I say, well, you seem to be a little stout around the girth. Uh, where, where do you get that from? Well, you know, beer belongs in joy, you know, in friendly, freedom-loving America. You keep on drinking that stuff, you look like you swallow an air hose, man. <laughs> I mean, uh, you say this fellow's saved and says he drinks. Well, and I'm not a drunkard. Don't get me wrong, preacher, I'm not a drunkard. I mean, I, I, I don't drink any straight whiskey, you know, straight gin, you know, and I'm not a, not a drunkard. I just, you know, a little Cuba Libre, you know, sidecar, boxcar, Manhattan, martini, Singapore sling, slow gin fizz, Tom Collins, rum Collins, margarita, just a little, little toddy, you know, you know, and for Christmas, you know, and Thanksgiving, New Year's, and Fourth of July, and Armistice Day, and <laughs> when I get up in the morning. <laughs> but, but don't get me wrong, I'm no drunkard, I can take it or leave it. Now you take that fellow, he saves, says he is. You say, I don't think a fellow can be saved and drink. Well, you're entitled to your opinion. You say, you mean to tell me if Ruckman, a fellow can be saved and drink? Well, I didn't say he could. And listen, don't you go out here and say, Ruckman said, if a fellow gets saved and then takes a drink, he loses salvation. I didn't say that either. You say, what did you say? Well, what I said was, if he's saved, there he is. See, if he's saved. Now, you know what that book says? That book says, what? No, you're not your body, the temple, the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Can you glorify God in your body with that stuff? The fellow says, yeah, I can. Okay. Put, chug a lug, man. Proof. Drink her down. Skull. Cheers. <laughs> Drink it. He says, well, I don't think a fellow can glorify God. Then quit it. Now, brethren, the, 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 the rule for life is simple as a Christian. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, kick yourself around the block. 
You're going to kick the preacher, ain't his problem, it's your problem. Amen. Folks say, well, Ruckman, I just wouldn't, I, I think a preacher doesn't, shouldn't talk about them things. You say, I wouldn't talk about them, well, that's why you're not called to preach. <laughs> I mean, if, if, you know, if I was sitting where you were sitting, and you were standing where I'm standing, and you were talking to me like I'm talking to you right now, you know what I'd do if I thought I was right? I mean, people know me, know I'm telling the truth about this. If I was sitting where you were sitting, and you were up here, and you were getting on me like I'm getting on you right now, and I thought I was right, you know what I'd do? I'd just go right ahead and do it. I wouldn't pay attention to you. If I thought I was right, I'd go ahead and do it no matter whether you thought it was right or not. If I thought a thing was right to do, I'd do it if the whole body of Christ said it was wrong, I wouldn't give them the time of day. Now, how, how is it with you? You say, Ruckman, I think if you think it's right, do it. Amen? Amen. If you think it's wrong, quit it. Amen? Amen. If you can't quit it, kick thine own self. <laughs> you folks lose your sense of humor this quick in the, in the, in the evening? We're just getting started, man. This is the introduction. We're not anywhere here yet. All right. Uh, pardon me, madam. Are you saved? Uh, oh, I'm a member of the First Methodist Church. Oh, I say, good. Are you saved Methodist or lost Methodist? Well, I'm not a heathen, you know. <laughs> well, all right. I didn't mean to dent your offender. I just wonder if you're saved. Well, of course I'm saved. Of course I'm saved. I say, good. You know, the hardest thing you ever had to do in your life is get people to say they're saved. Everybody in America has contracted lockjaw or something. I don't know what it is. Are you saved? I'm a Presbyterian. Well, I'm a Republican. What's the deal? <laughs> I'm a, are you saved? I'm a Catholic. Are you saved? I'm an uh, Episcopalian. <laughs> are you saved? I was baptized when I was 12 years old. Are you saved? My father is a... People are weird, you know. Uh, it's like saying, how old are you? And the fellow says, five feet six. <laughs> And I say, are you married? And he says, 140 pounds. <laughs> the, the mind gone, see? I asked a fellow one time, I said, uh, are you a Christian? He said, you see that, don't you? And showed me a ring. Yes. Well, what does a ring got to do with being <laughs> saved? <laughs> are you saved? I looked at it, I said, yeah, pretty ring, isn't it? <laughs> I found later it was a 32nd degree mason, whatever that is. But I didn't know what it was. I said, are you saved? Yeah, you see that ring, don't you? Well, what the ring got to do with being saved? Yes, fellow, you say I'm a Catholic. Well, the word's not even in the Bible. Amen. There's no such thing as a Catholic in the Bible. Not even in a Catholic Bible. Why would you say that? You say, well, there are a lot of things that rap terms aren't in the Bible. The term rapture is in the Bible. The term trinity is in the Bible. Yep, when well, you're talking about your salvation, you sure better have something that's in the Bible. Amen. You say, I'm a Catholic. What's that? Beats the fire out of me. All I know it ain't in the book. Now, what you got in your hand? Oh, a heart's spades, clubs, diamonds, deuces wild. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I'm no gambler, you know. I don't play the five card, draw a seven card stud. They're just, you know, a little game of rook once in a while, you know. You know, you know uh, hearts, you know, rummy. You say that playing cards is sin? I didn't say it was a sin. I said, she says she's saved and she plays cards. You say, can the Christian play cards and be saved? Well, if they can, there she is right there, if she is. You say, I'm playing with all right to play cards. I didn't say that. I said, if she is, there she is. You know what the book says? The book says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all the glory of God, giving thanks to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, can you do that for the glory of God? You say, yes, I can. Okay, deal. No problem. What's the problem, man? If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, you've got a problem. Uh, you, you think it's all right? Help yourself. Don't you go out of here. Don't you go out of here and lie about me. That preacher down there at that church down there said, everybody played cards and they're going to hell. I didn't say that. I said, if she is, there she is. You know, oh, you know Lord, bless this deal and give me a good hand. <laughs> Cut. Thank you. <laughs> Lord. Blackjack, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> I mean, the book says, whatever you do, do all the glory of God. If you can do it, the glory of God, go on and do it. Deal. Look at you mad at me, you rascal. If it's right, do it. Quit whining. 
If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, kick my own self. <laughs> uh, pardon me, young woman, are you saved? Oh, my, yes, it's the only way to be. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I say, uh, uh, what happened to your head there? Did you get run over by a lawnmower or something? <laughs> You go to sleep in the barber's chair, you know, you know, you know this kind, you know this kind. Hollywood says, you know, Hollywood says, uh, you know, take them up, up they come. Hollywood says, drop them, down they go. Hollywood says, let it grow long now, it starts growing long. Hollywood says, it's time to cut it, you cut it. You follow the world, you know. You know what that Bible says? The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the room of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you know why most young people will never find the will of God for their lives and consequently be uh, failures? I mean, I heard Bob Jones Sr. say many years ago, and I'm certain he was right. I heard Bob Jones Sr. say many years ago, he said, the young person in this life who finds out what God wants them to do and does it is a success. And he says, being a success is finding out what God wants you to do and doing it. Why, by that standard, uh, Dean Martin and uh, Johnny Carson are failures. By that thing, Gates and Bill Turner are failures. By that thing, Michael Jordan isn't anything. If success is finding out what God wants you to do and doing it, those people are flops. Amen. John Paul Getty, Ted Turner, that bunch, those millionaires, they're not successes. They're washouts. Amen. Yeah. Living this sort of 60, 70 years, never find out what God wants you to do. You call that a success? But listen, you can't find out what God wants you to do. He said, be not conformed this world, but be transformed by the room of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Young people, you can't find the will of God for your life if you're going to be conformed to the world. Now, you may be a Christian. I didn't say you're going to hell. I didn't say that. But if you're going to be conformed to the world, you can't find out what God wants you to do. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Got that? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What do you got in your hand there? Oh, uh, screen love, uh, uh, soap opera romance, uh, boy meets girl, girl meets boy, boy loses a girl. Uh, he got her heart, she got his heart. My heart's lost, running around here someplace, can't find a thing, what kind of business? TV or not TV, that is the question. TV guide. You say, she say, now don't go out of here and say, now, oh, down there, that church, there, that jubilee had a preacher down there coming there. It said, everybody has a television set, they're going to hell. <laughs> I didn't say that. And you say, well, it's all right for you to watch television. I didn't say that. You say, what did you say? I said, if she say, there she is. I mean, the light of the body is the eye and not the ear. What you see is ten times as dangerous what you hear. Because what you see, you're going to remember a lot longer than what you hear. And my Bible said, your eye is single, your body is full of light, your eye is evil, it's full of darkness. You say, do you watch television? Yeah, I watch it occasionally. I tell you what I watch. I watch uh, hockey games when they're on and prize fights. And be frank you, frankly, the rest of it bores me to death. <laughs> but you have to watch those things. If you've got a television set, you need to get you one of these little flipper blinkers where you can blink and get off it quick. Because in the best shows you're watching, there'll be a commercial right in the middle of it. And it'll have all the garbage right in the commercial. You can't escape it, people. I mean, I go to these motels up and down this country, all kinds of hours, all kinds of nights and places, and they used to have a thing in there where you come in there, if you go down to the front office and pay a little money, you get a special uh, channel, you know, with all the pornography on it. And the way of pornographic movies. Now most of these places you go into, they have one channel for that that you don't have to pay for. You go across there at night and click right in your face, boy, like that. Amen. And those places there, the kids have access to that now on the Internet, on the web, and on the TV in your home. You say, you got a television set in your house? Yes, sir, I do. 21 inches. You said a watch on it. Uh, well, we watch a number of things on it. We have, uh, the first rule is, where did you find that? He just handed it to me. Who handed it to you? Wayne, I don't know where he got it, but they found it. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Well, too bad I couldn't have preached you the message. I was going to preach you there. But <laughs> <laughs> Praise God for that, brother. That's some work, huh? Where's he at? When he comes in, I'd like to know where he found that thing. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Where'd you find that thing, brother?
She found it outside. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, uh, back there, back there, and uh, back at home, I have this 21 thing. The first rule is no channels. It has no tele. It has no aerial, so nobody can watch it. <laughs> it's what do you have it for? I have it for VCs and Nintendos, and I check the VCs and the Nintendos. And if something comes into my house, I know what comes into my house. And if my kid going to look at something, I check what they're looking at. And in case they sneak one in on me once in a while, I go back through and go through that pile of stuff and see what they got. And if I find something I don't like, I throw it out. Amen. And Nintendo games. Some of those games are good. I like Mario 3. <laughs> <laughs> Super Mario. <laughs> you say, Ruck, can you play that thing? Yeah, once in a while. Yeah, I sure do. You say, I think that's wrong. Okay, I think it's right. <laughs> see, see, see? If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. I can do some things you can't do with a good conscience, and you can some, do some things I can't do with a good conscience. See? Every one of us should give account of himself to God, you see? And they, they, they take the rest of that stuff that comes there. But most of my stuff is junk. So I sense it before it comes in. Now, they say, they say, there's a saying they have. And they, I saw this after World War II. After World War II, when we got back, television was just coming in about 1950. And one of the first things they showed in the, in the 50s was a series of things called uh, combat. And there were always shows about World War II, you know, and some were pretty realistic. And a lot of vets came back from World War II in pretty rough condition. I mean, a guy had been under shell fire for a long time. He's, you, you pull out a zipper and he'll hit the ground, hit the dirt, you know, when it goes over. And some of those vets were having nightmares at night. Boy, I mean, watching that thing, they'd watch that combat film, they'd go to bed at night, and some of them were waking up, standing in the bed, screaming without that, you know. And I was, saw one family down in Georgia where the guy, he, he finally got rid of his television set. The way he got rid of it, he'd been watching one of those combat films. He went to bed that night. And he and his wife lying there in bed, he was sound asleep, and he dreamt he was going up a hill in an assault with a BAR. That's a Browning automatic rifle. And it has a, has a clip, and, a, and the recoil is forward. The gas, it's a gas recoil that, that the gun rides up on you when it shoots. You go pop, 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 like that. And it, it, the recoil is forward. And we had to get rid of it because it had 21 movable parts in it, and we'd get dirt in it too easy. That's replaced now, an AK-47. Well, that BAR was a good weapon back in World War II. And he'd dream he'd go up this hill firing, and he'd go, bop, 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 and then he'd change a clip, and bop, 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 and change a clip. And about the third clip he changed, he heard a scream, and woke up, and he'd pull three curves out of his wife's hair. <laughs> that, fixed his, that fixed his television, brother. He quit fooling with the stuff after that. Oh, and I stop a fellow, I say, pardon me, sir, are you saved? Am I saved? Yes, are you saved? Well, of course I'm saved. I know more about the Bible. You know about if you'll be a thousand, young man. I know about superlapsarianism, infralapsarianism, the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. I know about the sacraments, the absolute contrition. What do you mean am I saved? You see my, my, my ministerial dress, don't you? I say, yeah, I see your ministerial dress. <laughs> Got your collar on backwards. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I mean, maybe he's not lost just because he has a collar on backwards. It might just be a dirty shirt or something, you know. <laughs> and I say, uh, are you saved? He says, of course I'm saved. I say, well, good. I say, good. What's you reading there? O-R-V, R-S-V, A-S-V, New A-S-V, N-I-V, Phillips, Moffat, Weymouth, Spider-Man, the Green Hornet, Calvin and Hobbes, Mickey Mouse, Daffy Duck. <laughs> You say, well, now, Ruckman, what about that fellow? Can anybody, uh, you know, believe in a, an NIV or an ASV and still be saved? I guess they can. I don't know. He says he is. If he is, there he is. I don't go out here and say, Ruckman said, nobody can be saved except out of a King James Bible. I've never taught that in my life. You can be saved through a gospel tract. Amen. You don't have to have a King James Bible to be saved. How many of you people know what a wordless book is? Let me see your hands. 
Somebody says, well, these new Bibles have all the fundamentals of faith in them. What does that mean? A theology book's got all the fundamentals of faith in it. That don't make it a Bible. Amen. People are weird, man. I mean, if you found a $5 bill in a sewer, you wouldn't call a sewer a bank. <laughs> and if you found a diamond ring in a trash can, you wouldn't call a trash can a jewelry store. Suppose you can find all the fundamentals in the new versions. What does that mean? Nothing. Nothing. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Amen. If they've got a little corruption in them, they've got a lot of corruption in them. That's where that goes. Now you take, uh, you, there are some people in this, in this country more fanatical about this than I am. You take Jack Hiles' paper, Hiles Anderson, in Indiana. Jack Hiles' paper up there in Hiles, Indiana, uh, uh, advertises the school, and the Sword of the Lord used to advertise big ads on Hiles' school before Hiles and Rice had a little trouble. And then some of the other papers give Jack a full spread now, Hiles Anderson College. We use nothing but the King James Bible in our classrooms. Well, we do. I use 28 different versions in my classrooms. I say they come down to PCS at Pensacola Christian College and Dell Johnson, Theodore Leas, a bunch of those backslid and apostates coming there and pulling a big stink. You can send your kid to PCS safely now. We believe the King James Bible. You liar. You don't think of the kind. Those people believe the text was a receptus is the Word of God. Those are Greek manuscripts. That ain't the King James Bible. And they say, well, we believe the King James Bible because we believe the Greek manuscripts it came from, all that kind of stuff. Therefore, anxious you to know we use nothing but the King James Bible in the classroom. I teach my, teach my kids the Greek text of Westcott and Horton Nestles. That is the apostate Greek text for every new Bible in the market. That's what we teach in my school. You know why I do that? To arm my kids so they know what's coming. Well, these fellows, they're big heretics and ruckman is. They're real ruckmanites. Using up the King James Bible. I, I, you know what I do with my kids? I send them down and have them read out the Living Bible, the Berkeley Version, Moffat, Weymouth, Good Speed, Phillips, Centennial, New World Translation, Jerusalem Translation, uh, New Jerusalem Translation, American Translation, New American Translation, Old ASV, New ASV, Old RSV, New SRV, RV, NIV, Nutty Edge Version, <laughs> and all that junk. 28 of those words I have them read and study. You say, why? To show them what's wrong in them. I wouldn't think of saying we use nothing but the King James Bible. We use all of them. We just believe one. You know why these fellows raise such a thing about we use only? Because they use, sure they use that only, but they believe the others. If you went to Bob Jones University and went up there to speak, speak on the platform, if you were a speaker invited in there, you know what you'd see under that platform? A little card. And I'm going to say, please use nothing but a King James Bible from this pulpit. What do you have to have that there for? Right. You wouldn't find that under one of my, under my pulpit. If you came to my pulpit in Pensacola, there wouldn't be a card back there telling you what to use. I don't give a cotton pick and flip what you use. <laughs> if you want to use a Roman Catholic uh, Douay Reims confraternity uh, Shalliner Reims version, don't remember it to me. I'm, I had one guy come to my church one time. He got used an ASV from the pulpit, you know. He didn't know he was a missionary and came in and didn't know too much about our stand. Hadn't heard much about it and came in and, and thought I, I didn't get up and say, Stop! You know, heresy, heresy! I don't have to do that in my church. Man, you come there, you can use a Jehovah Witness New World Translation if you want. It won't bother me. Eh? If, if you'll, you'll, you'll be bothered, though. Because my people... <laughs> You won't be going five minutes, you'll see my people going. <laughs> and you'll find yourself, you got in a ringer, boy. You don't have to tell them what's the truth. Just turn the truth loose on them. They'll find out what the truth is. All this stuff, Ruckman says and Ruckman says. You know what they got against me? I know what it is. And it ain't my married life either. That's all a smoke screen. A lot of their buddies in the same mess, and they give them a break. Don't kid me. That ain't the problem. You know what the problem is with Ruckman? I can tell you, see. I live with him. I know the rascal. I live with him. I know what the trouble is. The trouble is these guys are all first class Christians, and I'm about a second or third class. <laughs> and God keeps blessing me and blessing me, and he won't bless them. And it just kills them. It just eats their lunch. I mean, I'll go out in the summer and come back with 160 grown men to save. Some of those fellows haven't seen 50 grown men to save in a year, in 50 years in the ministry. 
that it's been going on having conferences. I'll get overseas and Lord Paul and take up 1,500 converted Hindu pastors and bring them in to me and they'll be my school. You know what's wrong with those fellows? They can't get a young man to follow them. Paul had a Timothy. Paul had a Titus. Every preacher in this world who is doing anything for God is, should be training a young man who's going to follow him. Where's Curtis Hudson's Timothy? Where's Jerry Falwell's Timothy? Where's Bob Jones Jr.'s Timothy? They haven't got any. A young man wouldn't follow them 15 feet. That's the trouble. I got out of my church and I got up there and here I'm sitting here and the men outnumber the women five to one. I got up here and I've got in that, that class I've got 80 young men sitting there. Anywhere between 15 and 50. Some on black belts and karate, some retired army officers, retired naval officers. That's what's wrong with Ruckman. So they say, you people of Ruckmanites, you're following Ruckman. You know why they say that? They say that because they want young men to follow them and a young man won't do it. And I know why he won't do it. The same reason I wouldn't do it. I'd walk right by him looking for a man. Amen, brother. Amen. If I'm looking for a man, I'd just walk right by the whole bunch and say, well, I ain't got time to fool you. Children should be seen, not heard, and go on by. They, they're not manly. They don't have any guts. They don't have any courage. Young men respond to that kind of thing. When I go to youth camp and stand up and start to speak, I usually begin this way. I say, when I look out at this vast sea of eager faces, ready to face the storms of life, and realize how many of you will never amount to hill of beans, it makes my heart sink down to my boots. <laughs> Isn't that a fine way to start a meeting? You know why I do that? I know young men. I've had to be with them all my life. I think I've been with men since I was 10 years old. I know them. Train them used to train them hand to hand how to kill each other with forks and knives and spoons and pencils. Pencil, you can kill a guy dead. I mean, right place. He can't put a tunic around his neck <laughs> and train these young men. I know young men. When I say that, when I say, now look out here and see how many of you are never going to mount the hill of beans, it makes my heart sink down in my boots. You know what happens when you say that? Some of those young men say, well, who does he think he is? The very idea of talking to me like that. I never heard of such a thing. <laughs> And there'll be some young fellow back there, that's the one I want. He'll be back there and he says, hey, is that so? Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> that's the boy I want. That's the boy I want. I know what's wrong with them. They can't get young men to follow them. I don't you misquote me. Don't you misquote me. I think that King James Bible is the scripture in English. I think that's for the English speaking people, that is the scripture. By that I mean it is given by inspiration of God and until some man shows me a mistake in it, as far as I'm concerned, it's infallible and without error. Amen. That's my position in the King James Bible. I believe you can be saved from almost any Bible because there's enough in almost any Bible to give you the truth about salvation. Right. When I go to Spain, I don't preach out of a King James. I use Valera. When I go to Germany, I don't preach out of a King James. I use Luther. When I go over there to India to preach uh, over there, I don't... Uh, uh, Oh, preach out of a King James except to an interpreter, and the interpreter is using a Telugu Bible. When I go into Russia and preach out of a King James, the interpreter is coming out of a Greek Orthodox Bible. But as far as I'm concerned, that King James Bible is the ultimate in Bible translation. It's a pure language. It's the 20th century language. It's the language of the end time, and you'll never improve in a King James Bible. Amen. You can't. Some felt the original Greek. Greek, brethren, is a dead language. I tell them if I had the original Greek manuscripts that Paul wrote in the pulpit, I wouldn't use them in the pulpit. When I say that, these scholars just have a horror. See, they, they worship these pieces of junk they never seen. And they say, oh, the verbally inspired, plenary, original autographs. You wouldn't preach those? Of course not. That'd be a dumb thing to do. How many of you know Greek? If I preach out of a Greek Bible in Greek, how many of you would understand me? Let me see your hands. Anybody here? Well, that'd be a dumb thing to do, wouldn't it? <laughs> Why not preach out the universal language? The universal language is English. Amen. That's the business. Are uh, this fellow saved? I don't know. All I know is this. I know that I wouldn't fool with any book that low-rated Jesus Christ. 
And I can take you a new King James Bible and show you where it denies the virgin birth in Acts 4. It says, servant Jesus instead of thy holy child Jesus. I can show you a new King James Bible denies the infallible proofs of the resurrection, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. I can show you any one of those Bibles that attacks the virgin birth of Christ in 1 Timothy and the incarnation in 1st. I know where the verses are. 1 Timothy 3, 16. The Lord said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The Bible said that he may have the preeminence in all things. Why would you take a Bible that low rated Jesus Christ if you are a Christian? Now, I don't say he's lost. I mean, maybe you can wear your collar that way and be saved, see? Maybe you can. I say if he is, there he is. You see, you're not very definite tonight, Brother Ruffin. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm saying if he is, there he is. Pardon me, sir, you saved. Oh, yes, glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless God. Praise the Lamb forever. Glory. Hallelujah. I'm saved and sanctified. Have this evidence of baptism. The Holy Ghost. Talking other tongues. Whoopee. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I say, good. What you got in your mouth? Oh, <laughs> Have a Tampa, you know, Tampa Nugget, you know, White Owl, Muriel, you know, Paul Mall, you know, Camel, Chesterfield, uh, filter tip, cork tip, wine dip tip, <laughs> bite off the tip. <laughs> now, don't you go out here and say, now, Ruckman said down there, everybody that smokes is they're going to hell. You lying rascal, I didn't say it. And don't you go out here and say it's all right to smoke. I didn't say that either. So what do you say? I said, if you say, there he is. You can have him, there he is. Tobacco is a filthy weed. Amen. From the devil it doth proceed. It bur burns your fingers, uh, it stains your fingers, burns your clothes, makes a chimney of your nose. <laughs> 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 I'm preaching down in a, preaching a Baptist church down in Andalusia and uh, between Sunday school and the main service, you know, that some some folks have a nicotine fit, you know, between Sunday school and the main service. And they run out in front and light up, you know, and then come back in. And a bunch of them lighting up out there. And they'd, one guy about had a nicotine fit before he got out there. And the rest of his brethren were coming out the door. He said, look here, boys, I'm smoking. One of his buddies said, you ain't smoking. They said, the cigarette's smoking. You're just a sucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you take, uh, you take a, a, a thing like that. Do you have a strong thing with a filthy habit that is? I mean, here's old, here's old, what's his name, <clears throat> out there in Texas. I forget if that cowboy football player. Uh, he said, That's, that tobacco's too good to smoke, you know. I chew it, you know. All these baseball players, all these pitchers, you know. He's a filthy hat. I go, did you know something a fly wouldn't land on that? <laughs> did you know that? Can you think of putting something in your mouth a fly wouldn't land on? <laughs> Have you ever seen the stuff that flies land on? <laughs> what a thing, man. There isn't, there isn't a preacher. I don't guess there's a preacher anywhere, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure there's no preacher anywhere that hasn't made a dozen hospital calls where you go in that room and the guy's in his 50s, maybe one of your members, and that place got a stink in it to put a blister on a brick wall of 50 feet. And there's a bunch of ashtrays around with dead butts in them, you know. You know, boys, kissing a girl that smokes is kind of like licking an ashtray. <laughs> and you come in there and that smell in there, and you come up to the guy and say, what's wrong? And the guy says, uh, well, I don't know. <coughs> 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 Brother Rockman, they don't know <coughs> exactly what's wrong. <coughs> What's wrong? I can tell you what's wrong. You're dying. That's what's wrong with you, man. <laughs> now, you know how that thing works? Well, there it is right there, see? That's charcoal. Well, that's burnt wood. You see that residual leaves on your hands? That's why you have to have a chimney sweep every couple of years to clean out your chimney. Now, you smoke, and that stuff goes down there and builds up on your lungs. What do you reckon that thing will look like after you have two inches of that inside your lungs? Now, your lungs are like a big kind of a bellows, see? If you inhale, they swell up, and when they, you exhale, they close. And you go to the hospital, and the guy's in the, in the, in the tent, the oxygen tent, and you watch him breathe, and he's going. What's the matter? His lung is that big around. That's what's matter. Dying. Your lungs shouldn't be like that. Your lungs ought to go. Oh, 
like that. Not <laughs> You say he say, beats the fire out of me, he says he is. Uh, pardon me, young lady, are you saved? I'm not a young lady, I'm a young man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you could have fooled me, you know. I mean, five feet two and a half, six feet four. <laughs> Uh, folks say, how long is long? Well, that's easy. A woman's hair covers her forehead, or it covers the back of her neck, or it covers her ears. And if you have hair that covers the back of your ears, or your ears, or the back of your neck, or your forehead, you've got a woman's hair. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> if I was down in Pentecost, they say, I'm not going back to that Ruckman preach. He, he, get, he preaches against my hair. <laughs> oh, boy, ain't you a soldier of the cross, huh? I'll preach about your belly before I'm through. Preach about your wife, about your kids, and everything else. But you take that thing right there back in the old days, you know, old days, oh, 20 years ago, uh, when, when one of those things walked down the street, you couldn't tell it was, it turned around. And then it turned around, you knew whether it was male or female. Now, when they turn around, you don't know what it is. I mean, I have, I have been, I've been in a place, I was eating up at a restaurant up in, uh, Lonely, Michigan, when I meet up there with Brother Noe, and I was eating there in the breakfast in the morning, and I'd eat up at the counter, you know, but I'm by myself. And something waited on me for about 20 minutes. And to this day, I couldn't tell you what that thing was. I'm mean, as God is my witness, if I was called the judgment right now, and the Lord said, Pete, what was that? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I, looked at, I looked at the face, I said, it's a, it's a, it's a woman. I look at the upper part of the body, I said, no, it's a man. I look at the hips, I said, no, it's a woman. I have to look at the legs, I said, it's a man. I don't know what it was. It was a, it was a, it, it was a mystery program. It was a, a thing from outer space. I mean, I wonder what that cotton picking thing was. Out there in California, they marry him. They say, do you whatever you are, take whatever this is. <laughs> to be whatever you're trying to be. <laughs> I mean, when you get in a mess like that, who's the husband and who's the wife, would you tell me? <laughs> Beats the fire out of me. I stopped a guy downtown one time, and I said, are you saved? And he said, yes, I am. I said, well, I'm going to ask you a question. He was a long hair. I said, uh, would, you tell me, uh, would you tell me why you uh, uh, have, wear hair, uh, hair like that? Why do, you, why do you wear hair like a woman? So I'm not a woman. You better believe it. I said, I didn't say you were a woman. I said, why do you want to look like a woman? And he said, you don't think I'm a man just try me for size? I said, I didn't say that. I said, why do you want to look like a woman? So I'll have you know I'm a fifth damn degree in black belt karate. I said, are you deaf or what? <laughs> I mean, why do you want to look like a woman? That's the question. I heard an old color preacher preach one time. He, 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 he was going. You get a saved black preacher, you're really saved. You'll hear some preaching. Most trouble is most of them are communists are charismatic, but you get a black that really knows what he's talking about, boy, he'll go. I went on the radio saw on the TV this afternoon. I don't know who he was, but he was going, boy, about that thing in New York. He said, the trouble is you get your eyes in the wrong direction. He said, you get your eyes on them Eastern religions, you get your eyes off Jesus Christ, he says. And he says, it don't make any difference to me, but if the bombs come, let them come. If the missiles come, let them come. He says, I got a hiding place. And on he went. I mean, he was on it, boy. He was on it. And you take, uh, you take, you take, you take this, 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 this long hair thing. Oh, uh, this colored preacher said, "The Lord don't care if you get drunk." He said, "What the Lord wants to know is why did you get drunk?" Amen. Now that's profound. The Lord don't care if you smoke. What he wants to know is why did you smoke? Lord, I don't care if you have long hair and wear earrings, buddy, but why do you do it? Amen. That's the problem. Amen. But so if you can, find, you can find a why it is, you can get the guy fixed. But you've got to get the why. Now, like I said, back in the old days you could tell, but these days you don't. I, I don't pump iron anymore in a gym. I, I pump a little iron at home, you know, real little, you know. I mean, at my age, it isn't bodybuilding, it's care and maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> But I used to go lock these paws, and I've seen this muscle man standing around there, you know. Understand her. 
Some of them spend more time in front of the mirror than they do pumping iron, you know. And I see this bull, you know, built like King Kong, man, you know, 19-inch neck, you know, he weigh about 320, bench pressing 450 pounds, you know. Uh, shoulders come out of his ears, you know, like King Kong. And that guy, see that, that muscle man, I watch him go back in the, in the locker room, then he gets this hair dryer. <laughs> and the guy's sitting there going, <laughs> Man, there's something about that weird. Something about, about a guy muscle like a bull ape worrying about his hair. I don't know what that is, man. I wouldn't trust that fella if he wasn't that big. <laughs> you say, that thing is saved? Beats the fire out of me, you say it is. Pardon me, sir, are you saved? Yeah, what business is yours? <laughs> well, that's the one if you're saved, you're a Christian. Yeah, sure I am, get out of here. Well, we can talk about the Lord. Well, I never discussed religion and politics, beat it. You really got the joy, joy down in your heart, don't you, man? <laughs> yeah, get out of here. <laughs> Did you ever meet a fellow like that? You know, before he was saved, he said it's, uh, he said it's uh, temper, and after he gets saved, he calls it nerves. But it does about the same thing. A fellow said one time to General Andrew Jackson, he said, Jackson, you ought to control your temper. He said, shut up, you fool. I control more temper today than you do in a week. <laughs> <laughs> now, gentlemen, it's all right for a fellow to have temper. That's what a blade should have. Don't have temper to it. Hold an edge. Get a case, pardon blade, and hold the old edge. You're supposed to have temper to it, but you ain't supposed to lose it. A fellow said to Billy Sunday one time, he said, I got a bad temper, but he said, I just blow up and it's all over in a minute. And Billy said, so it's a shotgun blast and it blows everything to smithereens. <laughs> what that book says, be not hasty in my spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. That's what it says. Anger is cruel and wrath is outrageous, he says. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger is square in the bosom of fools. Don't lose your temper. How many times did you ever lose your temper and it paid off? I asked him out in the prisons. I said, how many of you guys, when you finally got mad, really got mad, how many times did you get in trouble, or how many times did it work out good because you did get mad? And I asked him, how many times did it work out good when you held your temper? Well, there's no, there's no contest. There's no contest. It might have worked out right one or two times, if you got mad for the right thing, Paul says, be angry, see, but sin not. That is, don't sin when you get angry. And he said, the married couple, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. As when you and your missus retire for the night, your uh, argument should be settled when the sun goes down. You say, why? Well, 24 hours long enough to be mad at anybody. <laughs> In the second place, you might not sleep too well. Now, a colored woman said to the judge, she said, well, I sleep with a knife under my pillow, and he sleeps with a gun under his pillow. Neither one of us sleeps very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's time, when it's time to quit, it's time to quit. I used to listen to an old uh, Scotch preacher, his name was Jane McGinley, and Jane McGinley was a character. And Jane McGinley was a, had a thick Scotch brogue. And Jane would say this, he'd say, one day he said I had a bad argument with the missus, and she was about to throw things, and I was mad at her, and she was mad at me. And they said, uh, I went out of the house that morning. She didn't speak to me, and she didn't speak to me when I got back. He said, that went on for three days. And he said, the third day, he said, I come down to the kitchen. And I said, all right, missus, I'll tell you what. He said, I'm going downtown today, and I'm going to get in a car wreck and get killed. And I'm going to have a funeral, and you're going to come to my funeral. I'm going to be stretched out there in that box. You're going to come by, look at me, and you'll be weeping your crocodile tears and say, oh, James, how much I miss you and all that. And when you come back there, I'm going to ask the Lord to let me come back to life just for about two minutes and sit up in that coffin and say, Woman, you wouldn't give me your forgiveness when I was alive and I don't want when I'm dead. <laughs> and she said, I'll forgive you, James. I'll forgive you. 24 hours long enough to lose temper. That fellow saved, says he is. You know, kind of come in, kicks the cat. Supper ready? You know. It's like when you get married. Before you get married, you're courting, you know. You go over there and you ring the doorbell and mother says, you say, Susie, ready? Uh, yeah, I said, You'll be, she'll be down in a minute. She's lying. And she says, you don't mind waiting, do you? say, of course not. You're lying. <laughs> I mean, a lot of that goes on courtship, you know. And then she comes down the stairs and all dialed up and you go out the car, you know, and open the door for her. And so then she, you shut the door and you walk around the car and get on the other side, you know, and say, you're comfortable. She's comfortable. You just ease that thing like a baby bug away from that curb, you know. 
They've been married about five years. <laughs> Wife, you ready yet? Well, I've got to fix the baby. Oh, you say that every night. I'm going to be late tonight. Oh, bump, 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 stomp over, get in the car, and vroom, 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 you know, race the motor. Out comes your wife out of the house with her dress looking like a battle flag and her hair looking like an accident going somewhere to happen. <laughs> and you reach across the front seat and open the door like that, might knock her eye teeth out. And she gets in and she hadn't got comfortable. <laughs> now you say a guy like that, you say, is he saved? Says he is. Says he is. He's far out of me. Says he is. Now ain't this a fine crew? You know what I'm drawing you here? I'm drawing you the church of Jesus Christ. That's them. That's them. And they have the hardest time getting through their head. And I don't know how you do get it through the head, really. But the trick in the Christian life is not to see how far you can go before you mess up. The, Christ, the thing in the Christian life is if a man wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I was this lady here. She doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, she doesn't dip, she doesn't dance, she doesn't chew, she doesn't go with them and do. She teaches Sunday school, she goes to church, she ties, you know, she reads her Bible, you know. Fine Christian woman, obviously saved. But my goodness, look at that tongue. <laughs> I mean, Sam Jones said some women have a tongue so long they can sit in the living room and lick a skillet cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> You know what Christians do sometimes? They quit drinking, quit smoking, quit dancing, quit cussing, all that stuff, and they make up for it with their big mouth. They make up their big mouth. You say, well, I passed this car, I saw it parked right next to that. You know that girl said she got saved last Sunday? Well, let me tell you something. Just today, I The thing that does damage is the local churches. I know, what, I, know, I know local churches. There's some things in life I don't know much about, but boy, do I know God's people. I've been thrown in with them all my life. I mean, I, I want to say it's been a bigger strain on me as it's been on you. <laughs> I like these guys here. You had no ghost you, that guy, and, and, and Spurgeon, that guy. And all I knew was unsaved people. When I got saved, God put me right in with the Christians, and I got in there so thick with them, I hardly had time to deal with unsaved people. All my life, I've had to deal with Christians. Most of the time, I have my, that's why I enjoy these prison junkets getting out with the unsaved. I get joined out there, getting out and talking with them a while. I get tired of Christians. Uh, God put me with them, so these are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Brother, learn to live with them. Man, it's been a, it's been a trip, I'll tell you. And it's been just hard on you as it's been on me. I understand that. I understand that. They're preachers in this country don't even think I'm saved. How many ever heard that? Let me see your hands. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, see? Uh, they, 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 they're not used to it yet. They say, what is it? Well, where that guy talks. Well, I was a man 27 years before I was a preacher, and I didn't drop my manhood when I got called to preach. I don't talk any different here than talk at home. Or on the hockey rink, or in a boat, or going down the white water in Tennessee last couple of months ago, or flying a plane in from Bombay. I'm the same guy. I don't see any reason to dress up my talk when I get up here. Amen. I'm the same guy that came up on the platform. These guys, I think, I think some people think when they get in the church, there's a transformation that takes place. Amen. They think when they come through the building, they'll suddenly get separated and holy or something. I don't know what it is, man. Listen, you're the same guy that argued with your wife all the way to church tonight. Amen. You're the same guy. You're the same guy. And come that door, didn't work any magical transformation for you. And didn't work any for me. And you take this thing, this thing is talk, 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 talk stuff. Uh, I've had to learn how to live with Christians. And they've had to learn how to live with me. And uh, something I don't understand about Christians. And I've said this before. And I haven't changed my mind in half a century. I can't understand why God's people have what they have are just always and whining and griping and complaining. I never could understand it. You've got, you, you got the right army, you've got the right commander, you've got the best provision, you've got a commander who cares for you, who will supply what you need in the combat, and give you an old folks soldier's home that you can't match Amen. when you die. Amen. Your body is the Holy Ghost, you have the temple inside you, you have the greatest book in the world right in your lap, 
and you've got Christ praying for you. And what do you want for a nickel, man? Now, some of you got real troubles. I know that. I know some of you got real troubles. And I sympathize with you. I really do. I've had I've, I've my times in children's hospitals and watching them. I've had my time in wards where they're all, the kid had his hand grown out of his elbow and his feet grown out of his knee. And the girl fell into a fire when she was five years old and faced black ever since. She had to wear a plastic mask. I know some folks in some real trouble. Real trouble. But a lot of Christians don't have real troubles, not big troubles. They just said something they don't like. Something the preacher said they don't like. Get upset. Whine, 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 whine. I'm not used to it yet. The gang I was with, I'm not justifying them. They're a bunch of rough, stealing, lying, swearing, killing, cheating, whoremongering rascals. And they were filthy, godless, depraved men. But I'll say one thing for them. I'll say two things for them. Most of them talk plain. That is, they said what they meant, meant what they said. I met an awful lot of Christians. You don't know what in the world they're doing, what they got going. And number two about those fellows, they could take it. They could take it. They couldn't just dish it out. They could take it. And I can't understand about some of you why that is. I never understood it. And you'll probably never understand me. Such language. Well, what a way to say the thing. Well, who ever heard of such a stuff? I was <laughs> But it must... It must hurt some of you to think that you're in the same family with me. <laughs> Could anything have been much worse? <laughs> I'm your brother in Christ, brother. Amen. That's something to think about, isn't it? All right, now, see these people here? All these people going along here. See this thing here? Be not hasty to utter a thing, anything with your mouth, because the Lord's in heaven. I suffer not the woman to teach, nor do you suffer though the man be a silence. For Adam is formed and not Eve. He let the woman learn the silence with all subjection. In a multitude of words there wanteth not sin. A fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. A hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. Is that tongue? I'll tell you what you do. You get home at night, you get your little highlighter and go through Proverbs and Psalms and mark every time the Bible has some sin in it about the tongue and you'll find there's more in that Bible said about sins of the tongue and the mouth than any other sin outside of idolatry. That's the main sin. It's with the mouth. You don't believe me? Go and check it out. Every time it says lips or mouth, the tongue is unruly evil, full of deadly poison, set on fire or hell. Herewith we bless God and curse men. Can the fountain bring forth water both sweet and bitter, and brethren, these things ought to be so. If any man bridle not his tongue, that man of religion is vain. It's all through there. You say she's saved? I don't know. Says she is. Oh, here they are. Now, isn't that something? That's the church of Jesus Christ on this earth. If an unsaved man looks at the church of Jesus Christ, that's what he sees. And that's why you can't blame some of them for feeling like they do. And here they are going on the pilgrim pathway, they say, washed in the blood, long white robes, treading the pilgrim pathway on the way to heaven. There they are. They say, now don't get me wrong, I don't say they're all saved. I don't say they're all lost. I mean, everybody talking about heaven isn't going there, heaven, heaven. But they say the same. Going along the world. Uh, see this lady back here? She doesn't drink, she doesn't smoke, doesn't dip, doesn't dance, doesn't chew, all that kind of thing. She goes to church regular, and I'm ashamed to draw her face. I'm just going to leave it blank. You say, why? She wouldn't walk around the block tell a sinner how to get saved. I mean, why are you talking about sins? How about that? I don't see how in the world any sinner could get his hot, bleeding feet off the pavements of hell and keep his mouth shut about it. Maybe if you're not winning the souls of witness to Christ, maybe you are saved. Okay, I'll grant you, maybe you are. If, if you are, there you are. But I don't understand it. Out of the abundance of a man, as hard his mouth speaks. I don't see how you could find Christ your Savior and be as thankful as you profess to believe and never open your mouth and tell somebody about it. Now, I know what these southern good old boys do. I know what they do. They say, well, preacher, I don't believe in talking about it. I believe in living it. So, yes, sir, a lot of folks talking about heaven and go on there. And I think a fellow ought to... Uh, not talk about it. He ought to live it, you know. That Bible doesn't say, let your uh, work so shine before men they may see your light. That book says, let your light, Christ, so shine before men they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know why a lot of you fellows don't speak up for Christ too much? 
Because when you do, people get noticing you. See? And you don't want them to notice you. You want to slip by through there somewhere. You get witness for Christ, and then you're a target. Then you want them to see your good works? I'll tell you how to do it. Just start witnessing for Christ, and they'll check your works out real quick. Believe me. And Southern is bad about that. Now, I'm, I'm Southern. I'm Southern in a way of thinking and talking and acting and everything else. I'm more Southern than a lot of Southerners are. Really. I mean, I could go in that detail, but I don't hear tonight. But I know how these Southern boys are. They'll sit around and say, well, I just don't even talk about it. Then you go with four or five of them, you know. Well, I was out there in that uh, uh, Bigfoot Lake, Real Foot Lake, you know, we were fishing for crappie. I had this here bass, uh, had bass lure, you know, and was a shallow runner, you know, and pork rye and yellowtail salad, I think it was, weedless. And I was coming out of a man, something hit me and wrapped me around that and blah, 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 blah. Out in this deer stand, I heard this thing behind me, man, I've been sitting there about an hour, just getting lights yet, hadn't seen a buck all morning. And I just turned around on my stool, you know, and kind of squeaked in the full of Man, I'm so an eight point, and that sucker jumped out, blah, blah, blah. Hey, boy! Thought you didn't believe in talking about it. Amen. You know what you like to talk about? What's on your heart? Amen. Out of the abundance of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. That's the business. Don't get me wrong, see? I mean, I've been dove hunting and quail hunting and shooting turkeys and shooting deer, jackrabbits, mullet fishing, bass fishing, fish Granada Dam, Pickworth Dam, Jim Woodworth Dam, Sardis Dam. By homemade lures, bucktail streamers. I know what it's like to get a limit. I enjoy that. But, brother, if you ever see the day when you're more happy about a limit of quail or dove than you are a sinner come down there getting saved, you're backslidden. Amen. They're worth a lot more than a stringer of fish. And speaking of a stringer of fish, have you got any on your stringer? You know what I mean? Two legged fish? Getting awful quiet in here, preacher, for some reason. <laughs> Did you know if a man fishes every day, eventually he'll catch a fish? You can't fish 365 days a year without catching a fish. They'll jump in the boat after a while. <laughs> I mean, I've seen them jump in the boat. Mullet, mullet. I've seen make the long jump, land right in your boat. And you may not catch, you may not catch the kind of fish you want. You may not get a, you know, something real good, you know, like a, like scamp, one of them, you know. That's, that, that's, that's the fish, the commercial fishing down the Gulf. Keep, they keep that one. They come in and sell the mackerel and bluefish, you know, and they keep the scam for themselves. And that's snook. That's snook. That's a fish. And it's, it's illegal to catch him in a net. So if you're out there catching mullet like I do with a throw net and get a, a snook and the game warden you catch you, you say, well, that's a smullet. <laughs> that's what you're telling me. <laughs> I didn't know it was a snook. It looked like a smullet, a smullet to me. <laughs> So I enjoy all that stuff, you see. But how about that other thing? Follow me, and I'll make you be fishers of men. I've been out at night, out in the surf out there in Pensacola at night, you know, on windy night, and pitched that thing out there and bought that thing in there. I mean, five mullet in it and a couple of sheephead and, oh, two spade fish and four speckled trout and one throw. You bring that thing and dump it on the beach, and I just dump it on the beach, and I run up down the beach shouting. <laughs> all by myself in the moonlight. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Praise God, you know. Good mess of fish. I said, I'd rather see. I'd rather see what we saw here just a couple of times this week. I wish I could see that every time I got it preached. See a grown man, get out of the seat and come down, boy, and get that thing fixed up. Amen. That's the catch, boy. That's the catch. Well, there they are. Ain't that a crew? Walking on the pilgrim pathway. This way to heaven. They walk along the pilgrim pathway, the world says, come in. And the juke joints say, come in. And the disco say, come in. And the fraternity say, come in. And the sorority say, come in. And the convention say, come in. And the United Nations says, come in. And God says, come out, come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, saith the Lord Almighty. The word for a church, brethren, is ecclesia. You know what ecclesia means? It means a called out, a called out, a called out assembly. Not called in, called out. 
Well, if they go along the pilgrim pathway and then up here is what? Well, here is Jesus Christ. Died on the cross for your sin, was buried the third day he rose again from the dead. To get to heaven you've got to come through, you've got to come by this. I am the way. The way of the cross leads home. And over here is the Savior. What did he do? He died on the cross for your sins and was buried. And the third day he rose again from the dead, according to Scripture. He died and buried and rose from the dead, and he's alive today. Uh, he stands at the crossroads of eternity, and he's been standing there for 2,000 years, inviting men to come unto him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The Spirit says, Come. The Bride says, Come. Whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Down there in uh, Pensacola, Florida, about, oh, about 15 years ago, we had a lady in the middle school down there that was talking with her class, and she wanted to give them a little history quiz. And she said, I'd like to have each one of you right now whom you consider to be the four greatest living people today. And some wrote down Billy Graham and Winston Churchill and some other stuff. And one kid wrote down Jesus Christ. And the teacher said, well, Jimmy, that's a good idea, but I asked for somebody who's living. And he said, he is. <laughs> that teacher had something to learn about that. And he points his finger right down this old sinner's face. And he says, you. And blessed is the man that knows when God is dealing with him. You know what our trouble is? Our trouble is when God says you, we say him, her, them, that, those, these, anybody, except us. I count the greatest day in my life, the 14th of March, 1949, when I was alone in the world without hope, without God, family gone, busted up, drinking myself to death in the flop house, 10 cents a bed and a can of spin down there in Pensacola, Florida, on my way to hell, in a dark room there where I've been reading a stolen Bible for about two or three weeks, the Holy Spirit pointed his finger right down that room where I was and said, you, you're going to hell. And he didn't say Hades either. <laughs> he said hell. And I knelt in that room in the dark, you know, 27 years old, felt like I was 50. I looked around through my past life and where I'd been, what I'd done, what I'd said, and I said to myself, yes, sir, boy, if everybody, if anybody was a candidate, buddy, you're a candidate. If anybody's going to make hell, Peter S., you're going to make it. And the Lord, I, I looked around the room to see if there was anybody there I could refer the message to, you see. And there wasn't anybody there, it was just me. And I found Christ within 24 hours of that, just like that. He says, you. He says, come to the fountain filled with blood, drawn in Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath that blood, lose all the guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. You. Like I said, uh, blessed is the man that knows when God is talking with him. And he says, you. And you know what this fellow says? He says, they. Did you get that? God says, you. And you say, them. That's what goes on. He says, they are any cleaner. Now look who's judging now. They say, judge not lest he be judged. Well, look who's judging now than I am. All right. Now, this fellow down here, I may take a little drink once in a while to steady my nerves, but at least I don't go around and stick my nose in everybody's business. This lady here, I want to play a little a friendly game of cards once in a while, but at least I don't smoke or drink and smoke like a lot of people do in my church. This fellow here, I may worry about my retirement, you know, but at least I'm not worldly like my congregation. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says, Every way of a man is pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. That Bible says there is a generation that is pure in their own eyes and yet not washed in their filthiness. That Bible says they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. Now, I've passed it down there. I'm, I'm the senior pastor down where I am right now in Pensacola. I've been passed down there in that place for 37 years. That was a 12, evangelist 12 years before that. But in 37 years down there and, and, and pastoring those people, uh, you know what I do when I want to see how I'm doing spiritually? I never compare myself with anybody in my congregation. Never. Never. People, you can always find somebody at this church who's in worse shape than you are spiritually. 
And as long as you can find him, you're going to hide behind him. I don't ever do it. Whenever I want to check my spiritual size, you know what I do? I get me some biographies by people like uh, Martin Luther and John Knox and J. Frank Norris and Billy Sunday, and I compare myself with those fellows. But I don't look quite as big. Anybody can find a Christian around somewhere that isn't good as he is. What people do is they do that. That's an alibi. I want to say something else before I close. Every one of you, every one of you Christians here, and every one of you unsaved people here in this building, you know somewhere, maybe not here, but you know somewhere in Carolina, maybe not right in this town, but you know somebody somewhere who's a real Christian. And you know they're a real Christian. And you know they're a more spiritual Christian than you are. Come on, can't you name a couple of them? By God, I can. I write you out a sheet full of them. It's who you compare yourself with. And what the Lord tells us to do is compare ourselves with Jesus Christ and quit looking at each other. So then everyone else should give a kind of himself to God. Now, you know who the biggest hypocrite in that picture is? I'll put a circle around him. He's right there. You know why? That fellow knows what to do. He lost and knows what to do to get saved and isn't doing it. He knows what to do and he's hiding behind somebody else. That's a hypocrite. You can't hide behind a hypocrite unless he's bigger than you are. <laughs> See? All right. Let's repeat this verse of Scripture so if we don't remember anything else, we'll at least learn one verse of Scripture while we're here. Oh, Brother, could, could I get you get soak that water for me? Sure. Uh, this verse says in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You got that? You're not responsible for your brother or sister's sins. The only way you're responsible is when you give account, make sure when you give account that you didn't do something or say something. You did it to aggravate the situation. In that case, you're responsible for that, but you're not responsible for what they did. You're responsible for what you did, and if it had a bad effect on them, then the Lord take care of you uh, on, on that grounds. But it says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Oh, and I'm going to say it, and if you were to say it with me. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let's try it again. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That will save you all kinds of trouble. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, once again, we ask you to bless upon the Word of God. May you prosper it and where you, to you send it. We pray it might uh, help your people out and, and make them see the, the trick in the Christian life is cross-bearing. It's not, it's not trying to see how far you can go because you cross the line before you get caught. The idea is, Lord, what will I have me to do? The thing is, Lord, what do you want me to do that I'm not doing? The thing is, Lord, what do you want me to quit that I am doing? Lord, uh, the trick is how can we do the thing that not only is, uh, is passable but pleasing in your sight? I'll just remain in prayer a few minutes for you with the heads bowed and eyes closed and think a while. And I've turned over a good many rocks tonight. Maybe some bugs crawling around. Maybe I missed yours. I may, I may have got all of them. Sometimes it's something you're not doing, God wants done. But I've turned over a few. And if God has spoken to your heart, or heads are bowed and eyes are closed, why don't you fix that thing up with God now? The reason why we have you bow your head and close your eyes is so it'll be just you and Him. That's why we do that. We're not trying to sleep up on, creep up on you and catch you while you're asleep. The idea is when you close your eyes, you can't see anybody. You can't see anything, just you and God. In hockey, that's called a face-off. That means one-on-one. -on -one. And as sure as I'm up here on this platform tonight, there's going to come a time, Christian, when it's going to be just you and God. Just you and Him. What do you say then? Why not make it tonight? You're going to have to do it sooner or later. 
Why wait till you die and then face it then and have it out? Why don't you have it out now? And say, Lord, well, the thing you've been dealing me about, I want to fix it. I want it right. I want it to please you. Maybe your case is tough. I know some tough ones. Boy, I know some tough ones. Maybe you'll have to say this, Lord, I want to please you. I must not be because my prayers aren't getting answered. Not of what I'm doing wrong. I've confessed my sin, doing all I can. But Lord, if you don't give me some help, I'm not going to make it. Unless you do something to make me different than I am, do something to help me be different than I am, I'm not going to be able to please you. Please help me. While we're in prayer, if there's some Christian here tonight, God's spoken to your heart and touched your heart about some of these things, I'm not going to ask you what they're about, which ones. But if God has spoken to your heart about some of these things I've talked about tonight, while we're in prayer, would you just slip out of your seat and come near the altar and kneel, and I'm going to have a word of prayer with you and for you if you'll come. Just slip out of your seat and come to the altar. And uh, I'm not going to ask you about what it is. But we're going to have prayer for you if you'll come. All right. Now let's kneel for a word of prayer. We're going to pray. And I, I'm going to tell you how I'm going to pray. So you can, you can turn it down, back out if you don't agree with it. But you listen to me pray. And if you can agree with me, say amen to it. I'm going to pray for you. Now tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask God to give you the grace the grace to overcome whatever sin it is that's breaking your fellowship with God. It's going to take grace for some of you. I know people in this world that think it's easy to drop cigarettes. They don't see what guy, why a guy can't quit smoking. But I've known guys smoke two packs a day for 20 years and boy, when they come off that thing, it's just like torture. And you'll, it's going to take grace. And I'm going to do this too. I'm going, to, I'm going to assume you people here at the altar are sincere. And I'm going to assume that you want to serve God so bad that you'd, willing, you'd be willing to serve Him if He'd come on your behalf and remove whatever it is. It might be a person. Remove whatever it is that's preventing you from serving the Lord. Now I'm going to assume you that that sincere. But you mean business. And I hope you do. All right. Father, here's some people that want to please you. They've expressed their desire by responding to the altar call. And I, I'm taking them at their word. I'm not doubting any of them. Some have probably been here before. I'm not doubting them for coming again. I don't believe they lie. I believe when people do this kind of thing, they mean it. Then time goes by, and they forget, and time goes by, and things come up. Maybe they think you didn't hear them, or maybe they think that uh, they, you're not going to answer the prayer. But I know if their heart's sincere, you won't turn them down, and you know their problem, you know their trouble. And Lord, I'm bringing to you right now, and laying them before you to help them. And Lord, I confess before you tonight, I can't do a thing. All I can do is talk. Tonight I couldn't even get a message together. I can't help them out. I can't live the lies for them. I can't remove the stumbling blocks. Us preachers, all we can do is just be faithful in preaching the Word. That's all we can do. We can preach the Word, minister the Word. That's all we can do. And Lord, I want you to do something tonight for these people here at the altar. If it's somebody in the way, you'll remove the stumbling block. If it's an income, if it's a job, if it's a sickness, if it's a handicap, Whatever it is that's causing them to stumble or preventing them from pleasing you, I pray you'll undertake for them so their life will be pleasing to you. Give them the grace, the power of the Holy Spirit they need. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.